I think that's everyone for now. So hello everybody and welcome to our cyber security webinar. My name is Louisa Lawrence. I'm the marketing and commercial manager for Integra Accounting. I'm so pleased to have you all here today and I encourage you to ask as many questions as you would like using the comments tab throughout the session. As mentioned in the meeting invite, there would also be an open Q&A session at the end. So for those of you who don't know who Integra Accounting are, we are specialist accountants to contractors, freelancers and small businesses. So we are proud to offer all inclusive accountancy packages to suit the needs of independent professionals and we are rated five stars on Google. So take a look when you can. So our business objective is basically to understand you and your business goals. So with that in mind, nothing is more important to us than keeping you and your business safe which is why I'm delighted to introduce Nadia from NAC, who is our lead speaker today and cybersecurity expert. Um, so NAC is our recommended partner. They have been providing cybersecurity protection for Integro for a number of years. Um, and sadly, with cyber attacks on the rise, it is important to understand why and how to keep yourselves protected. So in addition to this, we've actually been receiving a large volume of queries from those switching from accountancy firms who have sadly been recently hacked. So we'll also be covering how we keep our clients' data safe. So now we'll hand you over to the lovely Nadia to lead today's sessions and tell you a bit about herself and NAC. Thank you, Louisa. And hi, everyone. Lovely to be, I'm not seeing you, but I know you're here. <laughs> so lovely to be seeing you here. Um, I'm going to be sharing my screen. Um, in just a moment, just one household um, comment, which is that this is being recorded, as you should be able to see on the top of your screen. Um, but at the moment, um, nobody's got their camera on, um, so you're not visible. And um, as soon as you ask some questions in the chat, I will be happy to answer them. So I'll be sharing my screen now. And then we can get started. Louisa, could I just get a confirmation from you as soon as you can see my PowerPoint presentation? Yep, all clear my yep. sight. Perfect. Well, here we go then. Um, as I mentioned, I'm Nadia, co-founder and CEO of NAC Cyber. Um, a few years ago, my co-founder Chris, who is British, was working as a contractor in The Hague in the Netherlands. And as such, he had lots of tax queries and payroll queries, so he had an accountant. And he asked his accountant, um, what, did, what do you do to protect my data? Now, the answer that this accountant gave was actually the start of NAC. He said, I know I have to do something, but I don't really know what to do and I don't really know where to start. And that's really where the idea for NAC was born. So what NAC does is we protect small businesses. This includes anything from a one-man band, freelancers, to um to trios which are micro businesses to 200 person organizations and the analogy the musical analogy has just escaped me but we cover everything in the small to medium business segment now we protect them and make them gdpr compliant or through our application and um, when integro asked me to co-host the webinar with them today i of course immediately said yes and what we're going to talk about is how you um, can protect yourself, why you should protect yourself, as well as why you should care about GDPR um, as a freelancer or a micro business. And um, we're going to work on the quick wins. So what can you do today or tomorrow to protect yourself? As Louisa mentioned, questions are open in the chat. So feel free to pop them in there and then um, at the end of the webinar, I will have a Q&A session and answer them for you. So I want to take you through some stats before we begin. And that is starting with the target, firstly. In 2021, 41% of contractors and micro businesses were breached, which means they experienced some kind of attack or incident. This translates to one hack every 25 seconds. So that's quite often. Now, this is a stark contrast with the following stat, which is that actually 80% of freelancers don't actually think they are a target to cyber criminals. Um, 
what's important to remember here is that a lot of cyber incidents don't only happen as a result of criminal activity. Actually, in fact, 90% of cyber incidents are caused by simple human mistakes. And so you can imagine that incidents happen a lot more often than you think, and you will definitely not be um, safe from them at all times. Now, cybersecurity breaches, whatever cause they have, um, come at a massive cost. Um, it's estimated by Hiscox, the insurance provider, that um, cybersecurity breaches cost small businesses anywhere between £8,000 and £308,000. Now I can hear you thinking, yeah, but I'm tiny. £308,000 is never going to be applicable to me. What I found really interesting about this report was that it showed that the higher number was actually applicable to smaller companies. And there's many reasons for this. For instance, a lack of security measures or easy access, which is the following stat I want to talk to you about. Um, there is a, an, an, um, sorry, we can see that there are, um, that 40% of attacks actually occur as a result of phishing attacks. And this is quite simple. So we have all received those emails that have links in them that congratulate you on a win of a contest of a prize that state you have suddenly got lots of Bitcoin to redeem. Um, we've all got those. But as soon as you open them and click on a link or download an attachment, um, you are very vulnerable to attacks um, viruses being downloaded, ransomware being downloaded, and this is actually one of the most common ways that criminals gain access to your data in your account. This is a little bit of information on what are the main causes of cyber breaches and data breaches. So when I'm talking about cyber and data, I'm making a little bit of a, of a distinction, which I will go into in just a minute. Um, but important to remember is that it's all about um, information and accounts and machines and things like that. So phishing, malware and ransomware are three of the main ways attackers gain access to your systems, machines or data. Um, like I just mentioned, phishing is one of the one of the most common ones um, that we're seeing. Now, these can be exploited by cyber criminals. Um, to, for instance, download ransomware or um, onto your machine. This was, for instance, the case in the Optionis um, attack not too long ago in March, um, the Optionis group. And poor cyber hygiene, such as weak passwords, reused passwords, or having passwords in a file on your desktop stating, please hack me, it didn't actually say, please hack me, but it did read um, useful links and passwords. You can see why that's not a great idea. Attackers can get access to these sort of files to your computer and then get access to your network, which is exactly what happened in that specific attack. Now, if ransomware were to happen, if a hack were to happen, if a phishing attack was successfully carried out, um, who is liable? This is one of the main questions that I get from freelancers. And the assumption is that because they often work on site for a client, think about my co-founder, Chris, who was a contractor for NATO at the time. He was working in The Hague on site, but he was still responsible for the security of the systems, accounts and machines he had access to as a contractor. Can they hold you liable if something does happen? And the answer is yes, the contractor is liable. And this is because um, the contractor is the one who's asking for certain types of information or to access to certain types of machines and systems and accounts. And as such, that person, in this case, the contractor, is responsible for what happens to it. An important distinction to make here is that even when you work on site, for instance, you are still not an employee and as such you're a separate entity and the separate entity is responsible and liable for the security 
of your clients' systems, data and accounts and everything else you may imagine. And this is why it's so important for contractors to think about cybersecurity. Now, I want to take you through this whole systems, accounts, machines, data thing. What does that mean? It's important to remember that when we are talking in, in the context of cybersecurity or GDPR, actually, we're always thinking about three things, people, processes and technology. These are the assets a business has access to and control over. And these are the assets that a business wants to protect. These assets have three sides to them, confidentiality, integrity and availability and in cybersecurity, it is all about protecting the c i and a of people processes and technology the same actually goes for the gdpr the gdpr also looks at people processes and technology and is concerned with their confidentiality availability and integrity but with a narrower view namely to personal data. So it is a little bit more narrow than cybersecurity because cybersecurity also looks at business data and anything else, um, but they're all about the same thing. So this will help a bit in the other parts of this webinar when I'm talking about what we can do. I'm just gonna pop over to the chat. <laughs> Seeing if there's any questions, no questions so far. Um, going back to my presentation. So I want to um, talk to you about, sorry, I'm just going back for a moment because I want to talk to you about the quick wins. So we've talked about what is cybersecurity and GDPR concerned with. We've spoken about why it's important for contractors to worry about cybersecurity not only from a liability perspective, but also from a general business perspective. But there are a few quick wins. And these quick wins are hopefully as quick and as useful as I think they are. There's, of course, many, many, many different cybersecurity measures that you can take as a contractor. But what I want to do is make sure that you can take these away today and work on them tomorrow and make sure that you're a little bit safer from the get go. So the first one is related to what I mentioned um, just a moment ago. Um, there was a lot to do in the, in the cyber attacks um, of the umbrella companies and the umbrella groups that I spoke about a moment ago around passwords. So passwords is, they are an incredible, incredibly easy way to protect your accounts and your systems and your devices. This, of course, is not the case if your password is password or password one, two, three, or like I mentioned, if you have a file on your machine or in your notebook with all of your different passwords. So it's so important to have unique and strong passwords for each and every account. Now, having a strong password is only one half of account security. The second half is adding the necessary layer of the second factor authenticator. So when you have a strong account, a strong password for an account, that's great. But an important way to further protect yourself is really through two factor authentication. Now I know it's a bit of a faff because you always need your second factor, but this is the whole thing that gives you 100% more security because it's very unlikely that an outsider has access to your first factor, your password, and your second factor, like your mobile phone or your email. It's also really important to secure your connection. And when I say your connection, I mean your connection to the internet. So try to make a habit out of using a VPN whenever you're connecting to a Wi-Fi network, especially, especially, especially when it's an open or public Wi-Fi network. I was at the airport in Manchester or Birmingham a few weeks ago, I can't quite remember, but I was noticing that somebody had um, a certain operating system open and this operating system is called Linux and this is often used by a lot of people with very good intentions as well, obviously, but by a lot of people with bad intentions as well. 
It's one of the main operating systems that can run certain types of software that can then do some shady things. And I was seeing this, this person um, basically having a, 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 um, a program open with which they could hack into other people's computers through the open Wi-Fi network. So next time you're at the airport and your mobile phone automatically connects to the public Wi-Fi, you can do that, but just ensure you have a VPN on. Going to the second quick win, antivirus. I like to call antivirus a face mask for your laptop, sort of, keeping out all of those germs and those horrible things that you don't want to catch. Um, it's a very easy quick win to protect yourself and anything else on the network from viruses and other malware. Um, of which ransomware is one. And ransomware is, of course, the most dangerous one, which can spread through your network and infect other machines as well, in the same way that COVID would spread out very quickly and infect everyone around you. So that's really what you want to stop. So having an antivirus on and setting it to auto run, meaning that it automatically carries out these tests and checks if there's anything bad on your machine is very important and quite easy. Um, also, you can take it as a good reason to have a little break, have a little coffee, have a biscuit. I love it. The third one, the third quick win is um, backups. Back up basically everything that you can't afford to lose. Now, what this means is different for everybody. It depends on the type of organizations you work, you work with, like your clients. It depends on um, what work you carry out. But if, if you think that it would be quite annoying or even worse than annoying, if you didn't have access to certain types of information immediately or within a day or even within a week or a month, make sure you back it up. It may seem tedious, but it can be a lifesaver. Imagine getting into your home office or your office office or your client's workplace, opening your laptop to find out that you were infected with ransomware, you don't have access to any of your documents anymore, or the, even for, for the accountants on the call, imagine that everything's gone and the, and the VAT is due tomorrow. You have to, to really catch up, do everything manually. Um, it just costs you a lot of time. It can cost you a lot of money in terms of, for instance, not being able to take on extra work because you are so busy restoring everything you lost. It can mean forcing um, or being forced to give a discount to current customers because you feel that you weren't able to carry out the contract the way you wanted. So backing up is the third quick win. Then um, keep stock of all accounts and services. Now, what does this mean? As a freelancer or a contractor or a micro business or a small business, it's likely that you have a range of different devices, different accounts, different programs, different services that you use for all of your different clients. And you need those to carry out your work. A new client could mean installing additional software, signing up for a new service, creating an account with another communication tool like Slack and Jira and Confluence and what have we not. And it can quickly add up and become quite messy and overwhelming. It's essential to keep track of all of these different assets. Here is that word again. The different assets that you rely on for work and the associated clients and any information that you would need um, to make sure that information doesn't get mixed up. And this is all about the integrity of the data. So as I, as I mentioned before, cybersecurity and GDPR is about confidentiality, integrity and availability and having your data kept in the way that it was intended for, making sure it doesn't get changed or lost or anything. And um, one part of that is keeping it separate from each other, making sure you know what you're doing, for who and when, 
and how and that can all yeah it'd be quite messy if we don't have a way to keep track of this now this is also important if something were to happen so let's say you use a system for a client um, that has been um, hit with ransomware you want to make sure that you quickly can make take stock of what kind of data you have and from whom so that you can inform them on time that something's happening and you can you can make an assessment yourself as to of course what you tell them um, but there are quite some legal rules about when you need to inform a client and, and how and when so having this um, inventory is very important and very useful and finally this is a little bit less of a quick win but nonetheless very important and you can make a start at this incident response now incidents is is everything that we talked about today it can be a hack a ransomware attack getting a virus losing data because your laptop was stolen or anything it can happen from a simple mistake of sending the wrong file to the wrong email address it can be anything now these are all incidents it's extremely important also for contractors especially if you have customers like governmental institutions or large enterprises to make sure that you deal with incidents in the appropriate way now one element of this is having an incident response plan and this incident response plan details what you would do if the worst were to happen and it tells you um who to contact and which devices need to be isolated from your network or in other words protected from ransomware um, what data needs to be preserved from whom etc now you can have plans all you want and you can have policies all you want and i love those because i'm a lawyer but if you don't use them and if you don't practice them they are useless so incident response testing is one of the things i wanted to mention to you today incident response testing is simply going through your plan and pretending acting as if an incident had happened and see if you know what to do and if you can handle it within the in the proper time frame um i am going into my last topic my last slide before the Q&A. Now we started a couple of minutes late, Louisa, so I'm wondering if I can take three minutes extra or so to make sure we have time for the questions. That's absolutely fine. And of course, guys, this is recorded. So if anybody I appreciate maybe joining from work themselves, um, if you need to leave at any point, um, we will be sending a copy of this uh, presentation uh, and a copy of this webinar to everybody on email. So exactly exactly so don't worry about forgetting all the things i've blabbed on about um you'll be getting <laughs> the information <laughs> um as well as some other cool stuff after this webinar so don't worry so just my final topic as a gdpr lawyer i had to mention it why do contractors need to care about gdpr i'm way too small right no no organization is too small to be held um to be uh, having to comply with the gdpr in fact um i'm seeing gdpr fines being given out to contractors um, more and more and um yeah this this can be quite quite scary for, for small businesses that don't really know what to do or where to start but being held liable at the same time um like I mentioned before, contractors are responsible for the information and systems and account, accounts they hold from their clients. But when we look at GDPR, we just look at data. So I'm just mentioning data for now. This responsibility, if not carried out properly, can lead to liability. And so the idea that just because you are a contractor, and you're therefore not liable and, and the responsibility always lies with the end client is simply not, it's not true there are of course a couple of exceptions um but then you would go into a courtroom and and fight with your client and uh, try to determine whether you are an, a contractor or 
something that we sort of call a hidden employee, but those are really the exceptions. So you, you can assume that you're responsible. Um, like I mentioned, we're seeing contractors being given GDPR fines. Um, that can, of course, uh, depending on the situation, the amounts are very different. Not to worry, we're not talking about millions or even thousands. One of the um, GDPR fines for contractors I've seen was a couple of hundred pounds. So you could survive it, but still it's not very nice and it's a waste of money and I'd rather go out to dinner for that money. Um, now, some contractors also need to show their customers, like governments, like enterprises, that they're compliant. And it's, it's best to not start thinking about compliance at the moment that you're being asked for proof. It's best to start thinking about it now, be proactive about it, and just rest easy knowing that it's taken care of. Now, how do you become GDPR compliant? This is a combination of policies, contracts, organizational measures, technical measures, and training. Um, I, I simply do not have the time to go into detail about what these policies are, what these measures are, but there is lots of information to be found online, on our website. Um, just um, make sure you start thinking about this now. Now, one last thing I want to mention is that a lot of people I speak to, especially micro businesses, they, they say to me, yeah, but I already have a privacy policy on my website, so I'm fine. Um, having a privacy policy is a great first step, but it's definitely not enough. It's like having an accountant. This is great, but the accountant doesn't actually do anything. So you can have one, but if you don't work with it, if you don't, and if you don't have the rest of your compliance stuff, then um, yeah, that's not enough. So I would love to go over to the question section of this webinar. Um, I'm going to go into the chat. Tim. So sadly, we have to drop yeah, so sadly, a few people have had to leave. Um, but again, not to worry, those that weren't able to finish the session. Uh, we had a few questions coming in advance of this presentation, which has been fantastic. So honestly, Nadia, thank you so much for going through all those details. And again, it raises that question of whether or not, you know, following this, do we talk about GDPR just on its own? Do we really investigate why that should be so important? It's something that as a company, we're a little bit naive to. I'm naive to it as well. So it's something I find so interesting, you know, especially when speaking to clients. Um, so some of the questions we did have um, in advance was how should a small business easily develop a cyber plan? So that's a bit of a heavy one, but mm. I can see why there's 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 it's been asked. So yes, yeah, definitely. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> exactly. How should you easily develop one? Well. Easy being the word I'm going to skimp over. <laughs> um, well, there is a scheme called Cyber Essentials. And Cyber Essentials is firstly a way uh, to help small and medium and micro businesses um, to make sure that they take the right cybersecurity measures. It's a governmental scheme and there's loads of organizations like NAC that can help you implement this. This um, ensures that you take the right measures. Now, a cyber plan depends on the organization, the context, your customers, your information, the stuff that you work with. Um, the easiest way is two things. One, look online if you can find a template um, that you can then bespokeify for yourself. Two is we can provide you with one. So if you're really in a bind and you like, I don't know what to do, where to start, like so many, then um, then then obviously we can make one for you. Does that answer the question, Louisa? I love that. That's brilliant. And I do feel like there is so many avenues we could go down with that question. But again, guys, after this webinar, we will be sending details of lovely Nadia and the guys at NAC and we'll be offering, offering a special discounted offer. So again, feel free to engage afterwards. And again, any of those templates and any questions off the back of this you want to send myself, we can always respond to and try and see if there's a way just to help you a little bit. Um, okay, so 
as my accountant, what steps have you taken to make your system secure as they can be? So again, a little bit of a one for more what we're doing as an organization, but again, okay, what should all accountants be doing really? Because you do an amazing sure. job for us. Yeah. <laughs> so there is, again, we have to look at the different assets that we spoke about before. So we're looking at people, processes, and technology. We're looking to secure all of those. And what Integro has done and what other accountants need to be doing is making sure their machines are protected, making sure their online accounts are protected, and making sure that the way they interact with those machines and accounts and things online is secure as well. So this includes having firewalls and turning on encryption, having antivirus, having backups, um, we scan Integro's website for vulnerabilities. We are going to be looking at endpoint protection. Um, it's really this this question is can be answered really broadly. But what we're doing for most for most companies and what any company should be doing to begin with is the basics, like what I mentioned about cyber essentials. That consists of five controls. Um, I'm, I'm going to test myself if I know them off the back of my. Well, if I know them by heart, but we've got uh, firewalls, we've got antivirus, we've got patching. So that means updating machines and 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 account and, and software. Sorry, whenever an update becomes available, we've got secure configuration of laptops, and that includes like turning on encryption and removing unnecessary software and all of this good stuff. And then there's a fifth one, which I think might be passwords, but I'm not sure anymore. But anyway, there are a number of things that we're doing for Integro and a number of things that any accountant need to be doing, including these, but also they need to make sure that their staff is trained on how to spot phishing um, emails and how to deal with data and systems and information securely. Long answer, I'm sorry. Brilliant. No, no. And I feel that's a very valid point. Um, and just again, keeping on to that, um, looking at accountants and what they're doing and companies and kind of what they're doing. Again, one of the questions we had, and again, this was from a Integro accounting client of ours to say, you know, we offer free agent as part of our accounting package. We know other competitors do as well. Now, again, when you're using a third party, is my data secure? Again, all the scandal going on and on our market at the moment has raised a lot of questions. So, you know, why were they hacked versus why should I trust the likes of free agent for my bookkeeping software? That is their lifeline. That is their bread and butter. That is what they pour their data in. So is it safe was basically one of the questions. That's a great question. Yeah, I can imagine the uncertainty around it. So what happened with the, I can never pronounce it, up, up Optionis yes. group <laughs> um, was basically poor cyber hygiene, all of the stuff around the passwords, leading to access to the network, leading to ransomware being spread. So that's what happened. Um, I I use free agent myself, or we use it for, for that. And the thing that you can do to keep yourself secure in that sense is to vet your suppliers. This is not only a legal obligation, actually, um, because you are responsible, like I mentioned, for the information. So you need to make sure that the parties that you choose to work with are actually secure. And um, Free Agent is one of the companies that take security very, very, very seriously. That's not to say that nothing could ever happen, but if you were to vet your suppliers and just make sure that they take the right measures, that they are responsible for their GDPR compliance as well, then you've done all you can. And you just need to make sure that you don't use um, a system your cousin Sal built. <laughs> um, if you use one of those mainstream uh, cloud providers, then um, yeah, chances are that they, they take cybersecurity very seriously and they do everything they can to prevent it. What happened at Optionis, again, was having these 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 lists of passwords simply on a laptop, unprotected. Um, they got into the laptop, and that's how they got access to the network because the network password was listed in there. Um, yeah, so so it's just stupidity, frankly. Um, as long as 
companies just think a little bit and make sure that they train their staff um, they should be able to 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 prevent these sort of things 90 percent of the incidents are caused by human mistakes like that yeah um, if we can take the presentation off the shared screen, Nadia, that'd be great. I've just got two more questions from people. Sure. That'd be fantastic. Um, I suppose with various contractors shifting from umbrella to self-employed to limited company, I suppose we, you know, we spoke about if I was a limited company contractor working for an end client and I need to back up data, obviously that would be navigated by the end client exactly what they would need to do, how they would save it, etc. But what if you were an umbrella company contractor? Would you need to still do all these cyber measures or do you get a get, get out of jail free card? <laughs> Um, I wish. Oh, I love them. <laughs> um, no, so even if you are, are, you know, part of a bigger organization, then you are still responsible for what happens on your laptop. And I'm, I'm holding my laptop right now, or my mobile phone, or my tablet, or my whatever it is I'm using. So it is still very important to take to take those measures. And um, you will have some form of systems or data that you are that you are the sole controller over, like your your email or um, when you need to invoice and things like this. So there will always be elements that you need to protect and that you are responsible for. Of course, when when an umbrella company takes over a little bits of your work and and, and they take over bits of your security as well. Then of course you still have a role to play in making sure that they are doing what needs to be done. And if you are conscious of your of you know security best practices and GDPR compliance, then you could be an amazing advocate and to make sure that that you are collectively protected, that which includes yourself, obviously. Yeah, and so that just really shows that regardless of what you define yourself as a freelancer, as a consultant, etc., if you are ultimately looking after that data, you need to protect yourself. Otherwise, it could just be costly. Um, and the last question, and again, we could go on forever, and this has been so useful. And it's a really simple one. How often would you recommend to change a password? Which seems a really straightforward one, but having working with Integra Accounting I get told every single month I have to change my password or I have to make sure I have my measures up to date so what would you recommend somebody how often well I might be saying something controversial but if your password is secure you do not need to change it ever okay so at NAC, um, yeah, we don't have a change your password every every 90 days policy at all. Um, obviously, we keep track of whether our accounts have been mentioned in a data breach. You can do this with a simple website. Um, have I been pwned is, is, I think, quite a familiar one. You can check your domain and see if it's been listed as part of a data breach. If that is the case, change all of your passwords. But in general, if your password consists of enough characters, enough uh, combination of numbers and letters and capital letters and special characters and stuff like this, um, then there's really no need to change your password. I like it. I like the controversy of that statement. But no, <laughs> true, everything you've said, everything you've 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 guided us through today. Um, you know, if you're doing all the right steps, you shouldn't have. It shouldn't have to be tedious. It should not have to be time consuming um that's fantastic exactly. that as far as i have received is all the questions we've had so apologies for those that have stayed on and it's taken a little bit longer we appreciate you staying with us um so again thank you everyone for your time we ho truly hope this has been useful for you um so in the next couple of days please look out for an email from myself this will include a copy of the webinar as i mentioned a tailored pdf that we're going to be sending about all the top tips mentioned in a little bit more detail and a special discounted cybersecurity package that nac will put together so stay tuned for that um in the meantime should you wish to discuss anything further whether that be the for Integra Accounting or for NAC, please email myself, Louisa at IntegraAccounting.com. That was on the meeting invitation to just reply to that. Um, and we thank you all so much for your time and wish you all cyber safety. <laughs>
exactly. Thank you for having me, Louisa. Thank you, Nadia. I appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.